Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for these sheets and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe to hang out with your brother next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Bolin and Mako from Legend of Korra. One of them is stoic and steady, the other one is passionate and hot-headed. Weirdly, the fire one is stoic and the earth one is hot-headed. Guess I shouldn't have assumed their personalities based on their bending. I have a lot of growing to do. We'll make Mako first, since that's what their parents did. And for our goals, we like it hot. Firebenders bring the heat, both in terms of shooting fire out of their hands and making everyone want to date them. Making everybody want to continue dating them is another issue. Next, we need some shocking extra abilities. If you get the fire hot enough, it turns into lightning. That's rad. Finally, sometimes setting people on fire isn't as effective as punching them. Not totally sure why that happens, but you're good at punching anyway, so we'll get that. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi classing minimums in mind. Charisma will be number one. It's hot boy summer, or I guess winter. With you, it's hot boy all year round. Dexterity next. Dodging fireballs requires some quickness, and you don't want to get roasted by your own fire. Wisdom after that. As a detective, you need to be perceptive or investigative. Since Asami has sole custody of Team Avatar's one brain cell, that means you need perception. Follow that up with the Constitution. The benders got more powerful in the time skip since the original series, but not just the good ones. The baddie benders are badder than ever. You're going to take a beating sometime. Times. Strength is a bit low. You're athletic, but we can just grab athletics for that. You're not as buff as your ex. Finally, we'll dump intelligence. You grew up on the streets and then joined a professional fighting tournament. Neither of those things are going to help you do long division. I like Genasi, but benders get their powers from ancient turtle gods, not genies, so they're just humans with some extra souse. For your feet, elemental adept is kind of basic, but it lets you ignore resistances to fire damage and treat the ones you roll as twos with fire damage. If you plan on using a lot of one element, it's an obvious pick. Bump your wisdom and charisma with your two free points. Points, take persuasion for your skill of choice and build your own background for perception and investigation. It's got some cop flair to it. Also, keep in mind, Mako does the best thing a cop can do. He stops being a cop. We'll kick things off as a monk, mostly because I want skills from the monk list, and kicking things off as a spellcaster just means stinky hit die. Acrobatics and athletics will give you the physicality you need to be on Team Korra. For some reason, every avatar only hangs out with people who do backflips. It's a weird criteria for friendship, but I feel the exact same way, so I can't judge. You get martial arts letting you make your unarmed attacks using your dexterity modifier, they deal 1d4 plus your dexterity modifier in bludgeoning damage, and you can make a second unarmed attack with one after you make one with your action, getting a rapid fire combo of fists, a rapid fist combo. You can't use this while you're wearing armor, but you keep things pretty light, and monks get unarmored defense, making your AC 10 plus your dexterity and wisdom modifier when you're not wearing armor. Honestly, if you're sending out a bunch of heat, you probably don't want to be wearing a 20 pound set of heavy armor. We're going to bounce over to sorcerer right away since there's no reason to start there. Specifically, we're going draconic bloodline like we did with Zuko. Like like in the Zuko video, I'm explaining that dragons were the original firebenders. I'm explaining that, I've explicitly stated that, so don't ask why I didn't choose Pyromancer, because per the lore of Avatar, firebending is dragon stuff. And Pyromancer is from a weird Half-Life, not unearthed arcana supplement thing, it's icky. If you want to do a dragon warlock though, I did do a homebrew video about that. Anyway, you get draconic resilience, making your AC 13 plus your dexterity modifier when you're not wearing armor. This doesn't stack with unarmored defense for monk, but you could use it as an excuse to not invest in your wisdom modifier as much. This is going to be a bit mad. Multi-ability dependent. You also get one extra HP for every level you take in the Sorcerer class, which will offset the D6 hit die slightly. You can also choose a Draconic Ancestor. It doesn't really matter at this point, but red dragons do fire, and you're a fire man, so do fire. Of course, the real reason you came to Sorcerer is for spells and cantrips. Firebolt fires a ranged spell attack that deals 1d10 fire damage. It's the most basic fire attack you can get. Great Bonfire forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 5-foot radius, dealing 1d8 fire damage to those avail. It's also great for cooking. Light creates a light to help you see in the dark with your bad human eyes, and Control Flames lets you control flames for flavor stuff, changing the color of fire, making flames flicker, little things that don't deal damage. For your first level spells, Burning Hands lets you force a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 15-foot cone, dealing 3d6 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed, roasting a whole bunch of baddies at the same time. Jump triples your jump distance for a minute. You can't quite fly with your fire like the Human Torch, but you definitely can give yourself a little fiery boost. Second level sorcerers get a font of magic, letting you recover spell slots with some sorcery points, but do even cooler stuff next level. For now, enjoy another spell, like Shield, to add 5 to your AC as a reaction, burning up some incoming hits as soon as they come in. Third level sorcerers get Meta Magic, letting you spend your sorcery points to augment your spells. Careful Spell lets you give a number of creatures equal to your Charisma modifier advantage on saving throws against the spells you cast, so you won't kill your brother if he's in melee range of someone you want to throw hands at. Throw Burning Hands. 
at. Quicken Spell lets you cast a spell as a bonus action. This should take an action to cast, so you could pair your Firebolt with something like Scorching Ray. That's a spell that shoots three ranged spell attacks that deal 2d6 fire damage each. You can hit one target or multiple. There's three members on a pro bending team, hit them all at once, or hit one of them twice with a Quicken Firebolt. Four level sorcerers get an ability score improvement. Charisma should be your first priority. Flamethrower hands are going to be better than punching someone. For this level spell, Agonazer's Scorcher will hit people in a 30 foot line with a dexterity saving throw, dealing 3d8 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. It's a rare occurrence when you can get people all in a line, but when you do, make sure you're taking advantage of their bad positioning. Fifth level sorcerers can learn third level spells. Have you heard of Fireball? It's a pretty good spell for a firecaster, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 20 foot radius, dealing 8d6 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. The folks at Wizards of the Coast have admitted it's a little too good. When the people who make the game say the spell is too good, put that spell on your list. Sixth level Draconic Bloodline Sorcerers get Elemental Affinity, letting you add your Charisma modifier to the damage of one fire spell per round and spend a sorcery point after you cast a spell that deals fire damage to resist fire damage for an hour. Naturally, we need to grab a spell that deals lightning damage to not use any of that. Lightning Bolt forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 100 foot line, dealing 8d6 lightning damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. If you end up fighting another firebender, they might resist fire, so hit them with the lightning instead. At this point, I think we have a nice amount of bending, so let's get a little bit better at fighting. Second level monks get key points they can use to do cool bender stuff. Step of the Wind lets you dash or disengage as a bonus action and doubles your jump distance for the round. Pair this with jump to sextuple your jump distance, 60 feet horizontally or 18 feet vertically. That's basically a jetpack. Patient Defense lets you dodge as a bonus action, giving people disadvantage on attacks against you and advantage on dexterity saving throws. Very helpful against enemy firebenders. Flurry of Blows lets you make two unarmed attacks as a bonus action instead of one. Honestly, I'd save the key point for more mobility or defensive tactics. You can also be a hot stepper thanks to unarmored movement, making you faster when you're not wearing armor. You can basically move like a rocket and rockets explode! Third level monks get to choose a monastic tradition. Way of the Ascendant Dragon would be great if you had fists that got set on fire, but you don't. Four Elements Monk get a special exclusive elemental discipline, Fangs of the Fire Snake, letting you spend a key point to add 10 feet to the range of your unarmed attacks and make them deal fire damage. I guess technically this is also a fire fist, but it's more like little fire whips. It's much more Mako. You could also spend another key point to add a d10 of fire damage to each hit if you really need to roast someone. You can also deflect missiles, letting you reduce damage from incoming ranged attacks by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier and monk level. If you bring that down to zero, you can even send it back with a key point. Save your key point for more in character stuff, but don't be afraid to burn up some incoming arrows if you want. Four level monks get slow fall, letting you reduce falling damage by five times your monk level as a reaction. You pretty regularly hang out on the wing of a biplane. You don't do that if you're worried about hitting the ground. You also get an ability score improvement. Cap off your charisma modifier to be the hottest you can be. Fifth level monks get an extra attack for two attacks with your action, three attacks with a martial arts bonus action, and up to four with a flurry of blows. Honestly, Firebolt is going to be much more consistent since we invested in charisma first, but punching can be fun, especially with stunning strike, letting you spend a key point to force a constitution saving throw on a creature you hit with a weapon attack, failing that they're stunned until the end of your next turn, so you can fireball them and they'll automatically fail. It's a nasty combo if you can pull it off, but it uses your wisdom for the save, so you probably won't pull it off. Six level monks get key empowered strikes, letting you make your unarmed attacks magical in terms of overcoming resistances, put a little heat on your hits, and the robots shouldn't be an issue. For this level's attunement, sweeping cinder strike lets you cast burning hands with two key points using your wisdom modifier, so it's worse than just casting casting the spell, but if you're out of spell slots, it could be useful as a backup. Seventh level monks get evasion, letting you take half damage from failed dexterity saves and no damage from successful ones. With this, you can comfortably shoot fireballs at your feet and get away unscathed. It's a pretty massive flex. Stillness of mind lets you remove an effect of charming or frightening as an action. Despite how intense things get in the Korra era, Mako does a pretty good job of keeping his cool. Eighth level monks get another ability score improvement. Dexterity has to be the next priority, especially if you want to be a cool guy and shoot a fireball at your feet. Back over to Sorcerer now. Seventh level Sorcerers can learn fourth level spells. Fire Shield makes a shield out of fire or a shield from fire. The one made of fire is obviously a little more in character. That gives you resistance to cold damage, immunity to fire damage, and when a creature hits you with an attack within five feet of you, they take 2d8 fire damage. No concentration. It's one of my favorite spells for that reason. It's just an auto fire counter. The ice shield does the opposite thing, but don't do that because, you know, Mako doesn't do that. Eighth level sorcerers get another ability score improvement. Start working on that dexterity score to make you better at fighting, but more importantly, better at dodging. For this level spell, Wall of Fire creates a six 60 foot line, 20 foot high wall of fire, or a 20 foot diameter ringed wall, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures inside, dealing 5d8 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. As you hold it up for a minute, you can deal that 5d8 fire damage to a creature on one side of the wall. Fun combo here. Set yourself in the middle of the ringed wall with fire shield up so you're immune to the fire damage and fight someone at melee range to just auto burn them up while you punch them. When the smartest option you give someone is jumping through a giant wall of fire, you have the upper hand. Ninth level sorcerers can learn fifth level spells. Immolation forces a dexterity saving throw 
on one creature, dealing a d6 fire damage to the creature that fails and half as much to the creature that succeeds. That's the same amount of damage as fireball, but only on one target. Thankfully, it does another 4d6 of damage every round for a minute, depending on your concentration. And if you drop them to zero, the creature totally turns to ash. No healing, no spare the dying, they're ash. Might be a little too far for Mako, but in your home game, you can make him a murderer. 10th level sorcerers get another meta magic option. Heightened spell gives a creature disadvantage on a saving throw against a spell you cast, helping you make sure that you're getting your immolation or lightning bolt to deal some damage. To make up for lower skills than I'd like, we'll take the skill empowerment spell, letting you give yourself expertise in the skill of your choice for an hour, doubling your proficiency bonus with it to be a better investigator, or to break grapples easier with better acrobatics. 11th level sorcerers get 6th level spells, investiture of flame lets you be a fire boy, giving you immunity to fire damage, resistance to cold damage, creatures within 5 feet of you take a d10 of fire damage, and you can make a special attack that forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot line, dealing 4 d8 fire damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. It's a little more consistent and it has a bigger area than just fire bolting, not to mention the hot boy aura to keep people away from you. 12 level sorcerers get our last ability score improvement, cap off your dexterity modifier to punch and dodge the best you can. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you bring the heat! With fire shield and wall of fire being a delightful combo, especially with elemental adept, you're also great at keeping the heat off with evasion and multiple ways to resist fire damage. Finally, fire bolt and martial arts make you skilled at any range. For weaknesses, if someone is fully immune to fire damage, you're kind of screwed. You also went a little mad, with wisdom taking the big hit so your stunning strike and bunk burning hands won't be as good. Also, you could get more out of pretty much any other monastic tradition, four elements just gives you worse versions of things you got from sorcerer, but that's an easy fix. Team up with someone with a little more variety. You don't even need the avatar, just maybe a beefy brother who can dish out the bludgeoning damage. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need the rocks, bending and snapping the earth as we see fit. Next, we need a little rat buddy. Pabu is 90% of the power of Team Korra, and we all know it. Finally, you need to punch like your brother. Well, more heavily than your brother, if a little less finessed. For stats, we'll be using the standard pointer right from the player's handbook, but for stats, if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Wisdom will be number one. Earth bending is about steady connection to rocks beneath your feet. Strength next, Bolin is a himbo, so big strength is half of that. Charisma after after that, you're the world's first mover star. Obviously, you wouldn't be Nuck Tuck without nailing the audition. Follow that up with constitution, you need to be as thick as the rocks you're throwing. Dexterity is a bit low, you're pretty nimble, but not as quick as your brother and will dump intelligence. You're not as smart as Mako, and his intelligence is already negative. I'd put yours lower if I could. If your brother is a human, guess what that means you are? Human. Grab the tough feet. For two extra HP for every level you get, it'll just make you a bit beefier. There isn't an elemental adept for throwing rocks at people. Bump your wisdom and charisma with your two free points take persuasion for your skill of choice and the gladiator background for acrobatics and performance proficiency. You're a professional athlete turned mover star. That means Nuck Tuck movies are the avatar equivalent of Space Jam, or at the very least, Kazam. We'll kick things off as a fighter for athletics and animal handling so you can flex and flex your friendship with your best little buddy in the world. You can grab a fighting style like unarmed fighting to fight unarmed. That'll make your unarmed attacks deal 1d6 plus your strength modifier 1d8 if you have two free hands. It's best for bending to keep both hands free. It also lets you deal a d4 of damage to creatures you have grappled once per round, obviously Bolin is going to give the big old hugs. If you have a double header, you can use second wind to recover 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest. Pro bending seems like it might take a bit out of you. We're going to bounce over to Druid right away. We didn't start here because you get nothing from starting here except worse hit die. And intelligence and wisdom saving throws instead of strength and constitution. Let's be real though, if Bolin ever met a mind flayer, he should die. The big reason to go Druid is for spells and cantrips, like Mold Earth, letting you affect a 5 foot cube of ground, either moving it out, making it difficult terrain or changing its color. Get creative and use this how you want. It's basically the Minecraft spell or the Fortnite spell if you're younger than 22. Magic Stone lets you make some magical little rocks that you can throw to deal 1d6 plus your wisdom modifier, using your wisdom modifier to deal bludgeoning damage with a 60 foot range and yeet some rocks on demand. Since druids pick their leveled spells on a long rest rather than per level up like sorcerer, I'm just going to list all the spells that are in character and let you decide which ones you want. Earth Tremor forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures within 10 feet of you knocking them prone and dealing 1d6 bludgeoning damage if they fail, also turning that area into difficult terrain to slow people down. Thunder Wave forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot cube in front of you, dealing 2d8 thunder damage to those that fail and pushing them back 10 feet, half damage and no pushing if they succeed, hit them with those bad, 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 bad vibrations. That's the anti 
Beach Boys technique. Absorb elements will give you resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage as a reaction, and add a d6 of that damage to the attack next round. I'm mostly grabbing it for some elemental shielding from a little mud, but the extra damage isn't bad. Entangle turns a 20-foot radius into difficult terrain, forcing a strength saving throw on creatures inside. Failing that, they're restrained for up to a minute depending on your concentration, giving them disadvantage on your brother's fireball saves, or Korra's fireballs. We can also bump your mobility with Jump and Long Strider, tripling your jump distance and adding 10 feet to your movement speed if you want to move like a monk without investing in monk. Second level druids get wild shape, but we don't have to thanks to Wild Companion, letting you cast Find Familiar using your wild shapes instead. That summons a tiny animal, like a weasel, that you can control. You can perceive through its senses or cast touch range spells from its location, though Pabu doesn't do that, he just chews through ropes. Is that as good as wild shape? No, but it's more in character. You can also choose a circle, and land druids are the best earthbenders. You get an extra cantrip like Thunderclap to force a constitution saving throw on creatures within five feet of you, dealing a d6 of thunder damage to those that fail, it's a smaller, more on-demand shockwave. Even better, you get natural recovery, letting you recover some spell slots equal to half your druid level on a short rest, helping you get some bending back before the next round of the tournament starts. Third level druids can learn second level spells, and mountain land druids get spike growth for free, filling a 20-foot radius with difficult terrain, dealing 2d4 piercing damage for every five feet a creature moves for up to 10 minutes, depending on your concentration. Set it up outside your brother's firewall so they escape into spikes. For your spells of choice, hold person, forces a wisdom saving throw on a humanoid, failing that they're paralyzed for a minute depending on your concentration, meaning they automatically fail dexterity saving throws against your brother's fireballs. Wow, you two really are quite the team. Bark skin lets you boost your AC, making it 16 when you're not wearing armor. Obviously, it's supposed to be tree bark, but I don't think it would be too out of line to call it gravel. Fourth level druids get an ability score improvement, bump that wisdom up for better bending. Obviously, shaping the fabric of the earth is better than punching people, at least for now. Fifth level druids can learn third level spells. You get meld into stone for free, letting you seal yourself away into some stone. You'll be perfectly invisible inside it for up to eight hours, though you can't see out of it and have disadvantage on perception checks to see what's outside of it as well. It's pretty situational, but it's a great stalling tactic if you need to hide and wait it out. You can actually get a long rest off since it isn't a concentration spell. Imagine you're in a battle royale and you just decide to reset the clock. Of course, if someone breaks the stone you're in, you take damage, but use your mobility to get somewhere safe and then stall in a wall. Erupting Earth is a more offensive tactic, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 20-foot cube, dealing 3d12 bludgeoning damage before turning the area into difficult terrain, slowing down anyone who would be your adversary. Six level land druids get land stride, so you can move through difficult terrain you create without being slowed down. Obviously, making a bunch of difficult terrain isn't really all that helpful if you have to deal with it too. Seven level druids learn fourth level spells. Both options I want from this level come from the mountain land druid. Stone skin lets you give yourself resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for an hour depending on your concentration. Your AC is going to be pretty bad, but at least you can resist some physical damage and have a dump truck's worth of HP from tough. Stone shape lets you shape a five foot cube of stone into something that you want. Make yourself a rock club, but not like a place to hear rock music, like a stick to hit people with, knuck tuck smash, and whatnot. Eighth level druids get another ability score improvement, cap off your wisdom modifier for maximum earth bending. You can treat the ground like clay. Actually, some of it probably is clay. We'll bounce back to fighter now, giving you action surge to make two actions in one turn, once per short rest, shape yourself a rock club, then smash someone with it in the same turn. Third level fighters can choose a martial archetype. You're a pro bender and would have won the tournament if it didn't get attacked, so I think champion fits pretty well, giving you improved critical to critically hit on a 19 or 20 with your weapon attacks. This doesn't work with spell attacks, but you don't really have spell attacks. Earth bending is all about AoEs. Fourth level fighters get another ability score improvement, bump that strength score up so your punching can be on par with your bending, or at least, eh, closer. Fifth level fighters get an extra attack, letting you make two attacks with your action instead of one, or four with an action surge for a combo that really rocks. Sixth level fighters get another ability score improvement, keep pushing your strength higher, bowling requires great strength. I don't know if Bolin likes bowling, but I think an Avatar spin-off minigame, Bolin going Bolin, could be a hit. Reach out to me, Nickelodeon. I'll do whatever I can to make it happen. Seventh level champions are remarkable athletes, letting you add half your proficiency bonus to any strength, dexterity, or constitution check you're not proficient with, and add your strength modifier to the distance of a running long jump, helping you launch yourself with a little rock pillar thingy. Back over to Druid now, ninth level Druids can learn fifth level spells from the Mountain Druid. Pass wall opens up a five foot wide, eight foot tall, 20 foot deep hole in a wall for your party to pass through for an hour. You don't even have to say the elvish word for friend. Wall of stone creates 10, 10 by 10 foot panels of stone that are six inches thick or 10, 10 by 20 foot panels of stone that are three inches thick. Each of those has to touch another, but otherwise you can shape them however you like. Use this to make the ring of fire Mako makes literally impenetrable until they can bust through the 30 HP per inch of thickness the wall has. Hopefully Mako wins, he'll have advantage with the enemy taking 5d8 fire damage per round automatically, plus 2d8 every time they hit him with a melee attack without him even having to do anything. Transmute rock lets you turn 40 feet of rocks into mud or mud 
mud into rocks. If you turn rocks into mud, it forces a strength saving throw on creatures inside, restraining them until they can pass, and the area costs four times as much movement to get through. If you cast it on the ceiling, it forces a dexterity saving throw on creatures underneath it, dealing 4d8 bludgeoning damage to those that fail, and mudding them up. If you turn mud into rock, you force a dexterity saving throw on creatures inside, restraining them until they can make a DC 20 athletics check to break out, or deal 25 damage to the rock. It's a fun spell to get off, it basically lets you quicksand someone, like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. 10th level land druids are nature's ward, giving you advantage on saves against being charmed or frightened by elementals or fey. Bolin isn't too uncomfortable in the spirit world, it's the avatar equivalent of the Feywild. 11th level druids can learn 6th level spells, and Bones of the Earth is super rad. First, it's called Bones of the Earth, rad. It makes 6 pillars of earth with a 5 foot diameter that extend 30 feet into the air. If a creature doesn't want to ride your earth elevator, they can make a dexterity saving throw to jump off. The most fun part is pinching someone between the pillar and the ceiling, dealing 6d6 bludgeoning damage to them and restraining them so you can punch them a bunch. Investiture of Stone lets you become a rock man, but instead of being a blue bomber, you get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, force a dexterity saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot radius of you to knock them prone, and can move through the earth as if it were air, as long as you don't end your turn inside, helping you scoot around or move through walls. All of these buffs last for 10 minutes, depending on your concentration. 12 level druids got our last ability score improvement, cap off your strength modifier for maximum himbology. Our capstone is the 13th level of druid for some 7th level spells, and there aren't any lava spells, but lava is a big area of hot stuff. So is Firestorm, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures inside 10 10 foot cubes, dealing 7d10 fire damage to those that fail, letting you bring in a little wave of lava nobody will be surfing on. Finally, Move Earth is the ultimate earthbender technique. Even if it's a bit slow, it affects a 40 foot cube of earth, raising it or lowering it by 20 feet. You can make trenches, walls, get creative with it. Each change takes 10 minutes, but you can do this for two full hours, so you can basically create a battlefield that you'd prefer to fight on. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you slow people down, lock people down, lift people up. Basically, you decide where everyone is and how fast they're going to move. You're also great at defense, building walls, stone skin, or just rocking extra HP from tough to stay up for a long time. Finally, big strength is always important. Well, not always, but if you need strength, nobody is going to be able to persuade a boulder to clear the path, you know? For weaknesses, those fighter levels don't really do much for you beyond the ability score improvements. Benders in general don't gish very well, since they don't really get spells to help them fight, they just get spells and can fight. You're also lacking intelligence, so Feeble Mind could take away your bending. Finally, earth spells don't really pump out the damage. Bones of the Earth is really situational, and even then, it's three spell levels higher than Fireball and deals 2d6 less damage. But you just hold people steady and let your big bro dish out the damage. Bend that earth, bend that fire, bend however you want to bend. Bending is fun, and these builds let you bend. Just maybe keep a Sami with you. An entire party of dumped intelligence is not the smartest idea. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We're making double videos every day this month. Join the Patreon for this character sheet and a whole bunch more, and sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.